which is Beshalach, Beshalach Gimel, actually. Um, I want to begin, as always, um, by dedicating our learning um, in the schus of all those who need a refor shalema, specifically all those wounded in the current war in Israel, in the schus of all of the chayalim and the IDF, in the schus of all the hostages that they should be returned home, complete in body and in spirit and in mind, and that there should be shalom, shalom al Yisrael and shalom in the whole world, and that we know will only happen with the Geula Shlema, which we beg and, and 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 cry and beseech that it should happen immediately now. I also want to wish a happy birthday to Yehudas Edelman and a mazel tov to our classmate Zisi Raskin on the bar mitzvah and to be shvat of her grandson Yaakov Ben Zion Wilhelm. Um, I also want to uh, bring our attention to something important. And uh, please, um, if somebody, if I don't remember, which could happen very <laughs> easily, please um, remind me or somebody else can make this announcement. But Project Lakota Sichas has launched its annual um, charity drive to raise money for the project. Um, always is starts on Yutchva, which is when this project was conceived. Um, and I, I, it's, it's, quite clear that we all appreciate the project tremendously. Um, so anybody who could contribute, we have a team and um, it's really easy. You go online and you you could find that team. It, the truth is wherever you contribute to the project, it's fine, but it'd be nice if we can um, meet our goal and even supersede it. Last year, I think we raised almost $8,000 um, through our team. So if people could put it on their family chats or send the link to anybody that they think and every call pruta pruta mitzarefes, every little bit counts and is doubled. Um, and uh, it's not just for what's going on now, which is pretty unbelievable, but they are literally building a library because they are translating all of the sikhas um, to Hebrew, to Yiddish, to English, to French, Spanish, and this was not available prior to this. And every single week they work until the last minute to get these sikhs out in all the different languages. And this is um, these are priceless treasures for for forever. Um, so anybody who can give, this is a, a really really important thing for us to help out in whatever way we can. Okay, um, this week's sikha. Sif Aleph. Besim Parsha Senu, Bemas and Melchemes Amalek, the end of this week's Parsha, when it talks about um, the Melchama with Amalek, Hetik Rashi Menakosov as a Tevis, Rashi cites from the Pasuk the words. Um, so if you want to look into Chomshut Rashi, that's always the best way. It's Yud Zayin Yud Beis. Herak Yud Zayin Pasuk. Yudbeis. And Rashi says over there on the words, Vide Moshe Kvedim, and the hands of Moshe became heavy, Uperush, and Rashi explains, Bishvil Shenis Atzel Bemitzma, Umina Acher Taktov, Nisyakru Yadav. Rashi cites in the Mechilta that because Moshe was slack in performing the mitzvah of waging the war with Amalek, it's really hard to um, to say these words, obviously, and, uh, and, and the Rebbe is going to explain what this means. Um, but if we weren't talking about Moshe Rabbeinu, we would say that that word means like a laziness. And he um, appointed someone else in his place, and therefore... His hands became heavy or weary. And so simply speaking, what, what would be the explanation? Kavanas Rashi Lebar, it's Rashi's intention to explain that although Rashi seems to be explaining what was happening at that time presently, Mashma Shahayaza Oz Matsav Tmidi Etzlay, Mahmazik Nasai. 
And so you might understand that because because the because the Torah uses the word videi moshek fedim in the present tense, you might understand this as a um, a constant situation. He was older already, and so his hands grew weary more easily. But Rashi wants to undermine this, and he wants to explain that be'emes ein that no, this is not an ongoing situation due to his advanced age. Ella she'ira hadavar ba'esasha but it was only something that happened at that time for a particular reason. And what was the reason? Because Maisha was lax or um, in, in doing this mitzvah, his hands became heavy or weary. Okay. So that's the simple explanation of what Rashi is trying to tell us. Disabusing us of thinking that it's just Maisha's age and telling us, no, that this was some something that Hashem brought upon him for a very particular reason. Aval tzorech lahavit. But the Rebbe says we have to understand this because with Parsha Shmais, in Parsha Shmais, Allah Pasuk Vayhi Bederach Bemalayin Begoyim Vayivakesh Hamisai, in that very dramatic story when Moshe is on his way back to Mitzrayim with his family, and all of a sudden it becomes clear that the Malach Hamavis is attacking him, and um, his wife Tzipora realizes what happens, and she understands from the way that Moshe is being attacked and accosted by the Malach HaMavis, that it has to do with the fact that their son Eliezer was not circumcised and she takes a flint stone and she circumcises him. And on those words, here is Rashi, Rashi explains, Vayivakesh Hamisa Moshe. why did the Malach HaMavis want to take Moshe? Why do you want to kill him? Because he had not circumcised Eliezer, their son. And because he was remiss, or because he was lackadaisical, or because he procrastinated, he, actually the punishment of death was meted out to him. Tanya, we learn, Brisa teaches, Amar Rabiesi, Rabiesi said, Chas v'sholom. God forbid, God forbid to say about Moshe Rabbeinu that he was remiss, that he was dragging his feet, that he was procrastinating. Ella, but rather, Moshe Rabbeinu made a cheshben. Amar, Kadosh Baruch Hu Tzivani, Kadosh Baruch Hu commanded me to go back to Mitzrayim. And uh, you're not allowed to travel for at least three days after a bris. It's dangerous for the child to do so. So it must be that I have to do, I have to fulfill this command of Hashem first, and then uh, and then I'll I'll make the bris milah. But the Rebbe says that Rashi explains this. And because Rashi doesn't offer in our um, wait, hold on one second. Okay, so the Rebbe is saying that because he doesn't write on the second part of what he wrote, Shezehu Drash, that this is a Medrash, okay, it's a bazaar, the fact that he had this cheshbon, that it would be dangerous to travel after the Mila, so he put it off, the Leib Shudashon Mikram Mamash, and it would seem that this is not Shudashon Mikra literally, move on is understood, so because Rashi doesn't qualify, he doesn't equivocate, he doesn't say that the measure says, he just gives it to us straight that this was the Cheshben of Maisha. So it's understood, you cannot accept, you cannot um, go with Mahalach HaMachshaba, you cannot go with the mindset that Moshe Rabbeinu would do anything but act with alacrity to whatever Hashem commands it. The Imkain, and if so, if Rashi has already taught us earlier, and the and, and Mikra is always expected to remember what Rashi taught us earlier, 
And Rashi completely obviates the possibility of Moshe Rabbeinu acting with laxity, you know, um, being lackadaisical, procrastinating, but gives us this medrash, but he gives it to us as pshat, because the pshat is that you can't accept, there's no way to accept that Moshe Rabbeinu would not follow what Hashem tells him to do it and to do it immediately. Vim Cain, and if so, So how could Rashi come here and tell us that Moshe was somehow lax with a mitzvah and therefore he was punished that his hands grew weary? And why does Rashi do what he did previously in Chomesh and bring another pshat, bring another explanation that would obviate this explanation that Moshe is somehow lazy? In other words, earlier Rashi takes pains to say chas v'sholem and to disabuse us of thinking that Moshe Rabbeinu could act in in any way other than complete determination and zrizos to do what Hashem tells him to do. And here, Rashi saying, Shin is atzel. Yeserim mizu, and even more. Gam lefi perish alef berashi sham in a move on. And even according to the first explanation over there, it's it's not understood. Kevan shekvar ne nash meishal initialis rashlos b'mitzvah. Let's say we take away that Moshe had a cheshben, why he didn't uh, mal Eliezer right away. And let's just say that, that, he, that he was lackadaisical, that he didn't do it quickly enough. But because he was already punished, So Moshe has to be at least as intelligent and and with the program as a regular person, and a regular person, if you get punished for something, you make sure you don't do it again. You see that the ramifications are serious, and, and you don't take a chance. The imkain, mitzvah. So how could it be that Rashi should do it so simply without any qualification, without in any way, um, you know, mediating this harsh um, indictment of Moshe, just say it so pashat that Moshe shen is atzel b'mitzvah, that he was lack, lax, that he was lackadaisical in a mitzvah. That's the question. Base. B'midrashi chazal matzinu tamim noisafim l'kach shekav du yadav. And when we look into the midrashim, we find that there are reasons offered for why his hands became weary or heavy that L'chaira seemingly would would mean that Rashi doesn't have to be so harsh and say, there are other ways of understanding it. For instance, Okay, so this is a little bit maybe less harsh. Targum Yonison says, that he pushed off the war to the next day and he didn't act with alacrity with Zrizos on that day immediately as Hashem told him to. Beis, Oitamatsinu. Another another reason that's offered, Yakru Yadov Shal Meshe Mishuma Vainasehim Shal Yisro, that the reason why Meshe's hands became weary, Meshe's hands became heavy, was because of the sins of Bnei Yisrael. Sha'amru, that they said, Hayesh Hashem Bikarbenu, is Hashem really with us? Which was a terrible, terrible thing for them to assert, <laughs> given everything that they had just experienced, obviously. But this would take the blame off of Moshe completely. So the Rebbe explains why Rashi doesn't embrace these alternate explanations. Rashi and why doesn't Rashi bring down the first explanation, at least as a second explanation? Move on, it's understood. Because it's really the same idea as what he did right. 
But why did Rashi choose what he wrote and not what the Targum Yenison brings down, which is a little less harsh? It's not mistaber, it's not plausible that Moshe's laxity that is dragging his feet, as it were, quote unquote, should be so acute that it should push off the war by a whole day. Atkan. That, no. Rashi doesn't accept that. Okay, fine. But what we still have to understand is why did Rashi not bring down another explanation that's found? And the Rebbe brings down in a footnote that it's found in more than one place. Why, why, why doesn't Rashi bring that? That it's because of because of the sins of Ben Israel. It's not because of a deficit on the part of Moshe. Ubefrat, and the Rebbe says especially didan that in our particular case, inyan avaynaseim shal Yisrael ein chidush. It would be so intuitive. It would be so natural. It would be so simple for Rashi to say this because the fact that Ben Israel sinned. Is not a chiddush. Sharia davar niska kfarli il the perish Rashi, because in the same parak, if you go back to pasuk ches, so it's very fresh for the for the pshut for the ben chamish to mikra. It's right there in pasuk ches. If you look at Rashi on the words vayavai amalek, Rashi says samach parsha zul mikraza. The Torah places this section next to the previous. Verse, Laimar, as if to say, because what was in the previous verse? Look, Pasuk Zayin, Moshe called the place Masa Mariva, test and dispute. I'll read B'nai Yisrael because of the quarrel of Bnei Yisrael, but I'll as Hashem, and because they tested Hashem, Lamar to say, Hayesh Hashem Bikerbenu Im Ayin. Is Hashem with us or not? So Rashi already explained that this whole Sara of Amalek attacking them came because they said these words. So the so the Ben Chavash Bikr knows that they sinned and knows that Amalek came upon them because they sinned. So it would be so natural to say that because they sinned, they caused a weakness on the part of Moshe, which is also not a new concept. The Imkain, the Rebbe asked back in the Sicha, I'm sorry, let's go, let's finish. So, so, Avonisayim shal Yisrael eno chidah, shareya davar niskar kvar le'el b'perish Rashi, shem ikara. From the very beginning, Sibas Melchemes Amalek Hoisa Amirus Bnei Yisrael Hayesh Hashem Bekerbenu. From its very source, it's all about their sin. Ve'im Kain, and if so, Harei Matim Yoisil Lefarish Akapanim Keperisheni. It would have been more fitting, at least as a second parish, that Rashi should say, Asher Videi Moshe Kvedim Hayemishum Avon Esayim Shal Yisrael. That his hands were weary, his hands grew heavy because of the sins of Bnei Israel. Shekfar nisgru bekasov, which have already been mentioned in full throated fashion in the pasuk. Milohisiv shahayas the machmas initial this atzel etzel Moshe. This would all be so much more intuitive and certainly a more comfortable than saying that this became the case that his hands grew weary or heavy because of some kind of deficit in his Avedis Hashem. It's a very difficult thing to understand. Gimel, Sif Gimel. Bahakushi beferish Rashi, I'm sorry, Bahakushya beferish Rashi, Shenis Atzel Moshe be mitzvah, Umana Acher Tachtov, Mishazek is Biyeser Eis, Biyeser Eis. And the question on this Perish Rashi, the Rashi tells us that he was lax in the mitzvah and he appointed somebody else instead of him to go out in the war against Amalek is further strengthened. And it's further strengthened because in Parshas Pinchas, in Parshas Pinchas, 
Yifkoid Hashem ish ala eda asha yetzi lefnehem. Moshe asks Hashem to appoint somebody who will go with the nation, who will go upon the nation to war. Perish Rashi. Rashi there tells us, that Moshe's way was not like the kings of the other nations. They sit in their palace. They sit at home. They're all nice and safe and sequestered. And they send their troops out to war. Moshe says, no. This needs to happen the way I did it when I waged war against Sichem Va'ig, that I went out with Bnei Yisrael. Kiloimar, this is to teach us, this is to tell us, Shahayabaru Lemaisha, that Maisha had an MO. He had a way that he, that, he, that he led. He had a way that he functioned as a leader. It was clear to him, Sha'ish ala Eda, Sarach Ba'atzmai Latseis Lemachama. Maisha Rabbeinu had principles. He had a way that he did things, and it was clear to him that the person who is Al Ha'eda, who is the leader, has to himself go out to war. The yes, El Cain, and even more. And, and not only that, but when he spoke to Hashem and he said, Hashem, we need to appoint someone to go out to war, he brought himself as an example. But that's what he did. He had led B'nai Israel to war in the past. Even though he was already at a very, very advanced age, it was close to the end of his of his years. The Imkain, and if so, Tamur Biyaser. It's a very big wonder. So this is a question on the whole thesis of Rashi. How could it be that Rashi should say that there was some kind of hold back, uh, something held Moshe back, uh, that he was dawdling, that he was taking his time, that there was some kind of laxity, when we see that this was not the way Moshe operated. And this was when he was 40 years younger than when he went out against Sichem Va'ik. So, so, so we should say that it's because he was being lax, he was being lackadaisical, so this proves to us that whatever it means, we really have to unpack this and understand this properly. Because it definitely was not something that would contradict Maisha's idea of being Ish Allah Eda, the person who was the leader. Because he, the way he operated, Sarich let says by Atzma le Mechamis. Vilakach Shemaisha Atzma no came by Mechamis Sichem Vaik. He felt strongly that the leader has to go out to war, and in fact, he did that forty years later when he was much older. So, what is Rashi telling us here? So, in Seif Dalit, Rebbe says, "Be Yuvan will understand what Rashi is telling us." Bahaktim. By prefacing Hadiuk Bilshine Shal Rashi be Perushe Khan, Shashina Milshine be Perushe be Parsha Shmais Hanal. The Rebbe says we're going to understand this by very carefully parsing the words of Rashi, like the Rebbe does, put them under a microscope to analyze and to look at the difference in what Rashi says here vis a vis what Rashi says. The Rashi that the Rebbe already brought down for us in Parsha Shmais regarding the bris of Eliezer. There are two differences. Aleph, Sham Kasav Rashi Shenis Rashel, the Khan Shenis Atzel. Over there, Rashi brings down the Lashon Nis Rashel, which means to be remiss or to procrastinate. And here, he brings down the word Shenis Atzel, lax. Or if you were talking about anybody else, it would mean laziness. And Bayes, the second difference is Bepeirushim Parsha Shmois Nechtav Shenis Rashel Stam. Over there it says Stam that he procrastinated, that he was remiss. O Bepeirushim Khan, but here Shenis Atzel BeMitzvah. Rashi says that there was a laxity in fulfilling a mitzvah. 
What's the difference between Rashlanus and Atzlos? Rashlanus Hainu Yachas Kloli Shel Haznacha Verifyan. The term Rashlanus or that designation or that category is a more general one and it bespeaks uh, overarching neglect and perhaps weakness. And that causes procrastination and pushing off things. But it's a more systemic kind of thing. But the term atzlanos speaks to It's more specific. It speaks to the lack of alacrity of zrizos. Of, of hastiness in doing a particular action, a a particular action, halicha, going somewhere, kima, meshena, getting up from sleep. It's more specific. It's more honed in on, in a, on a particular thing. Okay. Omnam benidun didan loy heisa etel meisha atzla stan, chas v'shalom. But here, we're not just talking about aslos in the general sense. God forbid that we should say that about Meisha. But Rashi says, ki imshen is atzel b'mitzvah. That whatever this was, it was, it was, we're talking about a mitzvah. Lagabe ha-mitzvah nizkeres kan. Nech shav ha-dover atzlos. That by putting the word mitzvah in, Rashi's telling us, that vis-a-vis -vis relevant to the mitzvah that is being spoken about here, which is the Muhamma with Amalek, whatever Moshe did or didn't do was considered an Indian of Atzlus. And what does this mean? So the Rebbe is going to explain. What was it that Moshe did or didn't do that Rashi is referring to? So first, the Rebbe explains what's the simple explanation for why Moshe did not go out in Mechamas HaMalik it was neither that he was remiss and he was procrastinating or that he was lax or lazy God forbid Ella, what's the simple explanation for why he comported himself the way he did because he felt that it was not the right thing. It wasn't fitting because of his advanced age to go out to Muhamma. And obviously the Rebbe is going to explain to us why this was different from a Muhamma that he did go out to 40 years later. The Yaseira Mizu, and even more. Halicha Bereish Anshe Tzaba Bahanahagas Muhamma to go out at the very head of the whole army, to be the general, as it were, to lead. This is a type, a modality of leadership that is more fitting for somebody who is in the years delineated for going out to war. And the Torah tells us this is a job for people, for men, specifically between the ages of 20 and 60. And you might ask, we find that Moshe Rabbeinu at that time, at that age, did all kinds of miracles, many of which necessitated a crazy level of strength. And even more. Later, in the Melchama with Sichan and Aik, he did go out as the general. And he showed then an extraordinary type of strength. And he was at that time close to 120 years. 
הרי כאן, but over here, היה זה מצב אחר לגמרי. But this war was a whole different thing. Why? Because הנהגה זה קדוש ברוך הוא בני ישראל עד מלחמת המלאק, פסח שלא יהיה על פי טבע. Because until this מלחמה, the whole relationship of Hashem with B'nai Yisrael was not al piteva. It transcended nature. Kim ba'if nisi. It was all miraculous. T'chil ha'aisais umaysim b'mitzrayim. First there were all the signs and the wonders that Hashem did in Mitzrayim. Then there was Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Then there was Kriyas Yamsuf shalachara. Then there was the splitting of the sea that came afterwards. Ba'achar kach yiridas haman ba'haslav. And then came the man, and then came the quail, the slav. And all of this, and the last two miracles sustained the Jews. So everything was happening in a way that was but when they came to Rafidim, and they said those iconic, awful words. Is Hashem among us or not? At that point, the paradigm shifted. And Hashem was not relating to them in a way of open and manifest miracles. But like the Rashi that we referenced earlier, the Rashi, it's quite a long Rashi, at the beginning of the conflict with Amalek, the Rashi says, this whole parsha of the Mechamas of the Malik comes right after the Pasuk where they say, to teach, I'm always with you, and I'm always at your beck and call. I'm always giving you what you need. And, and yet you express yourself and you ask if I am among you, I swear that the dog, meaning Amalek, will come and will attack you. And Rashi brings down there a mushal of a father who carries his child on his shoulders and his child said, I want this, so he bends down and gives him this. I want that, he bends down and gives him this. And then <laughs> the child says, is my father here? As if he doesn't recognize at all that his father's carrying him and his father's giving him this, his father's giving that. So the father throws him off of his shoulders. He says, you know what? You're, you're, you're asking if I'm here? You're questioning? I'll show you what it looks like when I, when I take you off my shoulders. Vahainu, meaning, The reason why Amalek came upon B'nai Yisrael. The reason why they were able to was because Hashem hid his face. It was the Indian of Hastar Espanim. It was no longer Nisim Gluim. It was no longer Lamalim Mederach HaTeva. O me'ach ha'she Yisrael ha'yu az b'matzav lo'i kiba'avar ela shal Hester Panim ve'hefach han ha'ganisis. So once we understand that B'nai Yisrael are not in their previous situation, but rather in a time where Hashem hides his face, and there's no longer Hanhaga Nisis, no longer miraculous uh, uh, relationship. So that's why this war had to be waged in a way that conforms with nature, because it was nothing about this war that was going to be the because they had lost that privilege because of the way they acted. And what happens in a melchama that's alpiteva? That you have to choose. You have to, you have to find the choicest men. You have to find the strongest people. And especially the generals have to be chosen. They have to be the best possible, the strongest, the smartest. And basic to choosing the right people to lead the war, Alpiteva, they have to be the right age. They have to be between 20 and 60. 
but in contradistinction, when it came 40 years later in the Melchama was Sichan and Oik, Melchama Shahisa that was a Melchama that transcended nature, because Hashem said very, very, very clearly in Parshas Chukas, Al Tira, do not be afraid. Don't Al Tira Isai, do not be afraid of him, of, of, of those nations. Ki biyadcha nasati Isai ves kal amai ves artsai va sisi loi va sisa loi kashara sisa le sichan melachemari. Don't worry, Maisha, don't be afraid. I gave them into your hand. It's a done deal. They're yours. The whole nation, the whole land. I'm going to do, I'm going to take care of them. It's done. So the Rebbe says, so when you're dealing with the Melchama, where Hashem says, Nasati, it's done. It, it, it's in the back. It's, it's, they're all given over to you. So in that kind of situation, there's no relevance to doing things according to Teva. So all the regular ways in which you would plan for a war are not necessary. But that's not the case in Muhammad's Amalek. So Maisha not going out was simply a result of how Bnei Yisrael had positioned themselves vis-a-vis -vis HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And, and they had that their relationship that was Lamalami Derech HaTeva had been suspended. So Maisha had to act in conformity with this new reality. And in this new reality, it doesn't make sense for him to go out to war. Zois va'ed. And as Iva, the Rebbe says, there's more than this. It's not just the negative, what he didn't do. But in a war, there's different, there's different strata. There's different considerations. Masha lo yishtate b'mulchama b'amolik, lo yihayirak inishal heder o shlilo. The fact that Moshe did not go out to war against Abalik, we need to focus not only on what he didn't do. It's true that because this was a Muhammad that was going to be waged according to the rubrics of nature, it was necessary that it should be helmed by Yahushua. And it was necessary that Moshe should not take part. That's not the whole picture. But in Moshe not going out, there was a positive thing that Moshe was opting to do here. Why? Because because even in a Muhammad that's going to be al piteva, you need two things. You need Aleph, Hishtadlos, Pu'ula, Tibis, Bahanahogas, Hamachama, Vizenasa, Ali, the Elu, Hashayachim, Lose, Giborim. You need, of course, all the natural um, overtures that are undertaken in, in winning a war and waging a war. And these have to be undertaken by people who are very strong and our warriors, but any war that Jews wage, natural or not, you need Nesinas Kayach V'siyua Me'kadosh Baruch Hu You need Hashem to give the Jewish army the Kayach and the assistance from above. And we see this today, that there's a tremendous, tremendous understanding that this is the case. Never before so many soldiers wearing tzitzis putting on tefillin, davening, etc., etc. There's a tremendous recognition of this. Rebbe says this is an Indian of Pshut Mikra. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be a big Talmud Chacham to understand. Even al piteva. This is absolutely necessary. And through this, we better understand what Rashi says on the words in our Parsha, in Pasuk Tes. Choose for us people. And Rashi cites 
the yare hate. They have to be gibarim. They have to be strong warriors, but they also have to be people who are yare hate. Shetehes chusan misayaitan. They have to be people who are deserving, who have schusim that will help them. So they need to be strong, but they need to be righteous. And the Rebbe says that Rashi puts it together, But if you look at what is seemingly the source for Rashi, he's citing it from Mechilta. In the Mechilta, they're presented as two different ways of understanding what does it mean, choose for us people. In other words, by using the term Bechar Lanu, it's understood that you're looking for a very specific type of person. But in the Mechilta, there are two opinions. Either you're looking for Giborim, you're looking for very strong, or you're looking for Yerichet. You're looking for people who have a lot of Yerushimayim. But Rashi presents it in Pshutosh Mikra, and he's teaching us that there are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. Because you need both. It's not one without the other. You need that they should be strong because they're going out in a, in a physical war according to the laws of nature. And you also need that they should be Yerichet so that they should merit the assistance from above. And so by Moshe not going out, these two aspects, these two facets were addressed. So by Moshe going out, you're addressing the need for normal, natural, brute strength. And therefore you need young soldiers, and therefore you need a younger um, person to lead them, and this is why Yeshua led them and not Moshe. But at the same time, you're also addressing Hatfila al ha'ezer v'siyoh mil But by Moshe not going out on the battlefield and, and remaining where he was, he was in a position to pray and to give them the help from above. Shebenei Yisrael yinatzku b'mechama tivis, Moshe staying behind put him in a position where he could daven and he could bring down the siyua, the help that they needed from above, that B'nai Yisrael should be victorious. And it's self-understood that Moshe is the best possible person to do this. You're choosing for us, for both of us. We're both waging this war together. Moshe was not recusing himself from this war. He was not being lackadaisical. He wasn't being dispassionate. He, he wasn't being, he wasn't neglecting anything. He was all in. He said, Bechar Lanu, for us. He didn't take himself out of the equation. Say, he lochim ba'amolik. We're going to do this together. You're going to go out and I'm going to stand on the mountaintop and I'm going to have the staff, the holy staff in my hand. And with this, he underscored and he brought attention to the two aspects that are necessary in Muhammad. That you have to practically wage this war. And for this, he assigned Yeshua. And Moshe took upon himself the davening part. And, and, and the mate of Hashem will be in my hand. And when he was atop the mountain, he was fasting. Rashi tells us also in our parak, in our parsha, that Moshe, Aaron, and Chor Mikan letainis shatzrichim shloisha laaber lofni hateva shabetainis hayashrim. That the Torah mentions Moshe, Aaron, Bechor, the 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 triumvirate, the threesome, 
to teach us, we learn from here that on a fast day, because people are more weak, you need three people to daven for the congregation. And we learn from this that they were fasting. And then on the words that his hands were steady and faithful, Rashi says, they were outstretched heavenward in prayer. And once we understand all this, so it becomes even easier to understand why Moshe did not go out. Not only because he felt that he wasn't the right age, but he felt that his attributes, his strengths were better used in a different capacity. Sorry, Betainis, Becholosh, Ena Matam Lateis the Mechama. And, 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 and so on top of his age, if he is fasting, <laughs> then he's definitely not fitting to go out to Mechama. And Beis, Be Yosef, Beresha, Giva, Be Imai Mata, Lekim, Ubaramas, Yodav, Yochlu, Bene Yisrael, Lir Oisai, Valle Deze, Kiblu, Tesefes, Koyach, Vaoiz, Be Mechama. That by being on top of the mountain, putting himself in that elevated position and lifting his hands to Hashem. And he had the Mata Elikim, he had the holy staff with him. B'nai Yisrael could see this because he was on top of the mountain. And they would, in seeing Moshe there, gain additional strength in fighting the war. Um, well, let me just open up the chat. I see something came across the chat. Uh, yeah, and Moshe sends Yeshua to show Yidin that Yeshua is a worthy leader, capable of bringing them into Eretz Yisrael. Yeah, beautiful, Jane. Thank you for adding that. Amnam Siv Zayin. However, Afal Pisha Moshe lo yatsal melchama mishum kach suicha liyos hanhaga b'melchamazu. So even though we're now convinced by what the Rebbe taught us that Moshe didn't go out because this is what was necessary. This war necessitated this type of behavior on the part of Moshe. And even though we understand that, but still in all, his hands were weakened because of Rashi Atam, and Rashi tells us that the reason his hands were weakened or weary was because he chose Yeshua to go out instead of him. And somehow this is indicative of his being lax in the mitzvah. So we have to still understand this because it's, it's still there. In other words, what does this mean? Because once we, we realize what is the context, Hashem gave a command. And therefore, Moshe should not have entered into any kind of calculations. He should have just gone out to Mechama. And although, yes, it's absolutely necessary to pray, and Moshe is the best one to do that, he could have taken the Matelukim with him, and there on the battlefield, he could have davened, could have offered a, a shorter davening. And the Rebbe brings down that we already learned earlier regarding Kriyas Yamsov. Also in our Parsha, B'nai Yisrael were in a terrible tzara. They felt that they were boxed in. Mitzrayim were behind them. The yam was in front of them. So Moshe davened. And Hashem said to Moshe, Why are you screaming to me? Why are you davening? Speak to B'nai Yisrael. And go forward and let them travel. Uka perish Rashi. And Rashi says there, Amar lo yekadosh baruch hu, Hashem said to Moshe, lo yeis ata laharech betfilo she Yisrael nestunu betzara. Now is not a time to involve yourself in elongated prayer when B'nai Yisrael are facing such a tzara. 
ולכן, אף שהיו למשה טעמים לכך שלא יצא בעצמי למלחמה, so although Moshe had very good reasons for not going out to war himself, and it, it, there was no selfishness to his calculations. Moshe had calculated that it made more sense for him to daven, but not because it was easier for him and not because it was safer for him, but because he felt that this was better for the war. It, it, it would be a greater contribution towards victory. And as already explained, he would fast and he would daven. And it's not that he just absconded on his duties. He painstakingly appointed someone instead of him. And the Rebbe brings down, and we learn that a shliach of a person is like themselves. So it's not like he was being negligent. It wasn't like he didn't care, Khalila. In another situation, this would have been what Maisha would have done. But since here we're talking about Hashem giving a command, <clears throat> this is considered like Moshe showed laxity. Relevant to, compared to what is called for. When there's a command from Hashem. There is a mitzvah. Because when Hashem gives a command, you have to be ready, you have to be all in, and you have to do it with alacrity to fulfill the mitzvah. And for this reason, <coughs> so he was punished measure for measure. His hands became weary. They became heavy. So how was he punished? He was davening with his hands outstretched, and that's where the heaviness and the weariness came. Seifches, v'yesh lahesepazeh. Rabbi hastens to add. The Rebbe wants to explain, yes, on the one hand, there was something here, but he wants to make sure we understand what it wasn't. Of course, the Rebbe says, it's not shayach, chas v'sholem, by Moshe, that Moshe should enter into calculations when he receives a direct command from Hashem. But in this particular case, it's a little bit more oblique. We don't find We don't find that it's a direct command from Hashem to go fight a Malik. And therefore, one might say, that if Hashem would have commanded Moshe, <clears throat> for sure, he would have done it without any cheshbonus at all. Oh, it's a saying, can you recap, Moshe wasn't acting 100% aligned with the mitzvah. So on one hand, Rashi says, is atzel b'mitzvah. There's a mitzvah to go out of Muhammad Samalik, and somehow there's a laxity on the part of Moshe. That's on one hand. Even though Moshe appointed somebody that seemingly, given the fact that this was going to be a Muhammad al piteva, is, is more fitting to be the one to go out physically. And he did not excuse himself. He did not recuse himself. He was very actively fighting the war in a way that was more matim, more aligned with what he can 
do. But still and all, since there was a tzivoy, a mitzvah of Hashem, somehow this is not considered 100% relative to Moshe, relative to the fact that this is a mitzvah, that, he, that there's some kind of atzlos here. But like the Rebbe said earlier, atzlos be mitzvah, vis-a-vis, it's not it's it's not something that we're saying Moshe has this trait or this characteristic, but vis-a-vis this mitzvah, there's some kind of uh something was held back, as it were. Okay. But the Rebbe said, but the Rebbe now goes back and says, but but I want to make sure you understand. If Hashem would have said to Moshe, say, there would have been no chishbainis. But it's not like that. But, but practically speaking, there was no direct command. But Moshe Rabbeinu, the faithful shepherd of Bnei Yisrael, he did it because it was self-understood that this is what had to be done. When Bnei Yisrael when Bnei Yisrael are being attacked by, by other nations, one has to go out and, and um, protect the Jews. And even in conformity with the understanding that the only people that Amalek could wage war on, the only people he could possibly harm are the Nechashalim, the weak, the stragglers. These are the Jews that were outside of the protective cloud. Savar Moshe. Still, Moshe believed that immediately you have to go out and you have to protect, and it doesn't matter which demographic, it doesn't matter who this is, <clears throat> that they are the ones that are Nechashalim. <clears throat> and we see this tenua, we see this modality, we see this mo on the part of Moshe much earlier when he was in, when he was in Mitzrayim. Moshe Moshe always felt this burning sense and this urgent sense of responsibility. As soon as he got older, he went out to see what was going on with his brethren. He was raised in the palace. But he did not turn a blind eye. He went out. And what did he do when he saw that a Mitzri was striking a Jew? Moshe Rabbeinu did not make any calculations. Does this person deserve to be stricken? Are they with the program or not? After all, we know that the largest majority of the Jews in Mitzrayim were, were assimilated, deeply assimilated. Moshe did not make a cheshben. But he immediately killed the Mitzri. And we know that this was a very dangerous thing that Moshe did, and he he suffered the ramifications thereof. But he didn't flinch. Um, what was the time sequencing here? Was this whole episode with, within one day, beginning with B'nai Yisrael's doubt? Hannah, I, I, it seems to me that this is all happening in, in, in close proximity in one day, but maybe somebody else could weigh in. But this is the way I'm understanding it. And therefore, because Moshe took the initiative to wage this war against Amalek, and yes, it's a mitzvah. It is what Moshe understood that this is what Hashem wanted from him. But it wasn't mifurash me Hashem. Hashem did not specifically mandate this. And so therefore, he calculated that in this case, because the war was being waged and he took responsibility for it, he took initiative, therefore he felt that this was not a situation in which there should not be calculation. In other words, if Hashem says do it, then, then you don't have to make any calculations. 
but he's not Hashem. So if he's taking the initiative, then seemingly it's incumbent upon him to do it in the most responsible way. But vis-a-vis Hashem, but, the, but, but still, Hashem reckoned it as some kind of holding back. There was some lack of alacrity. And, and these words are just so, so pointed towards us today. That when nations, hostile nations, come upon B'nai Yisrael to wage war, and even before Matan Tara, it is mitzvah. It is the biggest mitzvah. And we know that the Rebbe felt that Israel should have taken preemptive strike and made a, a mistake in the Yom Kippur War with that. And, and how the Rebbe taught that it's al pi shulchan aruch. Plain and pashat al pi shulchan aruch. Is a mitzvah that you have to protect Jews. And it's a mitzvah chikadayla. And it should be done with no second thoughts and no calculations. Even though in this case, there was no direct command, but still because of the mitzvah that you're talking about, there should have been no second guessing. There should have been no calculations. You go, and you go immediately, and you go yourself to protect the Jews. And now the Rebbe says, in the Perish Rashi Zen, Yeshna Haira Nifla Bavaydis Hashem. We learn a wondrous Haira in our Avaydis Hashem. Kol Inyinu Prat Betayu Haira Nitzchis. Bechol Azmanim Bechol HaMekaymes. This is something that the Rebbe drilled into us constantly, constantly. That every single detail, every single concept in the Torah is an eternal instruction for all time, for all places. But it's understood that this is even further underscored, and this is all the more the case when we talk about the Muhammad with Amalek. And there are two ways, at least, in which we see that the Hira here, the, the general idea that everything in the Torah is Hira, is on steroids when it comes to the Mechemes Amalek. Because about this, it says specifically in our parsha, Hashem says, write this down as a remembrance in, in the book of the Torah. Hainu. <clears throat> so there's, in general, anything that was written down in Torah <clears throat> has a particular strength because anything that's written in Torah is eternal. But in this case, but on top of the fact that anything that's written in the Torah is a eternal lesson and eternal instruction, but on top of that, the Torah itself says, write this in the Torah. So it's to the second power. And Beis, Bedibor Hashem Gufa, Nitna Hadgashal, Inin Hatmidius, Bahanitzchius, and then on top of that, Hashem says, this is a Muhammad to Hashem with Amalek from generation to generation. Which is why this reference made its way, very controversially so, into <laughs> some of the words that, that the Prime Minister of Israel said recently. And on top of all of this, and on top of what the Rebbe said, Aleph and Beis, this eternity regarding this Milchama comes to full expression with a mitzvah, 
mitzvahs asei minatayr liskor tamid masav haroim. There's a mitzvah asei to remember the peculiarly and specifically vile act of Amali constantly. O mitzvah liskor masa Amali b'chol yom l'kamadeis. Now, it's one of the sheish zechiras. So it's not just that we have a mitzvah to remember this, and therefore we make a very big effort to hear Pasha Zachar, because a mitzvah daraisa, and if we don't hear Pasha Zachar, then we hear the, the, the leaning on, on Purim. But it's, according to Kamadeis, a mitzvah every day. It's not just an avoida spiritually, but how the war should be waged is an eternal day-to-day -day practical hayra, not just on the spiritual realm. And how much more so this is relevant in our times, Ikvasit HaMashiachah. In Targum Yonison, he wrote, What does it mean that the Pasuk in our Parsha says, That this idea of Midor Dor is actually something that is divided in three dairies, and she'echad mehad dairies who dar de ikvas de mashiach. The first dar was the dar we're talking about now, Moshe Rabbeinu. The second dar was in the time of Shaul, when Hashem gave Shaul a specific command to, to wipe out a malik. And the third, Targum Yenison says, is our time, ikvas de mashiach. The Rebbe says, And we'll understand, see if you would, we'll understand this better by prefacing with a general question. And the, the general question is, Why would the Torah go there in the first place? To begin with, why would the Torah tell us that Moshe suffered some type of deficit, that his hands became weak, that his hands became weary. The Rashi should have to say that there's some kind of Indian of Atzlus by Moshe. Rashi taught us in, in Chumash Bereshis. There's a, there's a rule. Right? Very famous. That the Torah doesn't even want to say something negative about an animal. And that's why he doesn't say that Nayak should take in the behemoth Tameas. It says, Behemoth Einenu Tahar. Balachas Kama Bekama Kshem Duba Bebne Adam. How much more so you don't want to say something negative about a person? O Befrat Bene Yisrael, especially a Jew. O Befrat Pratios, Moshe Rabbeinu, Hanifcha Mikol Mina Adam. Moshe Rabbeinu was the pinnacle of all of humanity. And about him, really, it's necessary that Terry should say that his hands became weak, which points to some type of deficit. Some type of flaw. From this, we understand an eternal instruction from this story. And the, and the explanation is as follows. We have to understand. Who is the demographic that Amalek was attacking? He was only able to hurt, he was only able to impact the Jews who had a weakness in their Amuna. Like said above, a canal, in Parshas Kitsese, by Yizane Becha, the Rebbe adds, Rak, only, only the stragglers, only the weak ones. Dahainu mini, Kaperish Rashi, Chaserim Koyach, these were people that were weak. They were missing Koyach. Why? Machmas Chetam, Shahaya Anan Poyltan. They were missing strength because of their sins. Because of their sins, the cloud of glory ejected them. 
spit them out, evicted them. So they were out of the, let's just say the, the, um, Hey, what's the matter with me? The the Iron Dome. They 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 did not have that protection. Meaning, we have to understand that Amalek could not touch the Jews that were under the Anon. Only those that were out. And this repeats itself in all the generations. Look how the Rebbe is, Malam he says, most Jews are found within the cloud. They're under the Iron Dome. They are found within the parameters and the boundaries of Terah and mitzvahs. And generally speaking, they are connected to Hashem. Each person according to their according to their level. The Anan Mitzvahs, Megan Albane Yisrael, Mikol Ruchai Zares. And the Tara and Mitzvahs protects B'nai Yisrael from all strange winds, from all terrible things that might come upon them. All the strange winds that are blowing outside of the parameters of holiness. And especially they're protected from Amalek. And what's Amalek's specialty? To cool us off, to make us less excited, less enthusiastic, to make us more dispassionate and aloof from all things yadas. Amnam yeshnam yehudim, but there are Jews, shemisiba shoynes, for various reasons, enam b'teicha anan, they are not within the cloud. Seder ha'chayim shalahem adayan enay matim legamre le'es ata lahirois hatera. For the time being, right at this moment, the way that they lead their lives is not in conformity with the instructions of the Torah. And therefore, Yachal Amolek, and Amolek is bigamatria, suffolk, doubt. Amolek comes to cast doubt in our minds. Do we really have to be so connected to Hashem? Do we really have to take the words of Torah so seriously? But because they are not enveloped in the cloud, because they're at least now not living their their lives aligned with Tarimitzus. So Amalek is, is able to get us alayim, or to get us to them sveikas v'chulei, be'emuna b'yocheles Hashem, or kriyas ha'shakorcha b'nyani kedusha v'chulei. They're not protected, and when you're not protected, Amalek is able to get into their heads and to cast doubts in, in their in their emuna and Hashem, and in Hashem's capacity to protect them, etc., etc. V'alkein yitachein adavar, and therefore, it's possible. So a Jew that is under the Iron Dome, a Jew that is within the Anon, can say, what, what kind of connection do I have with these Jews who are not acting properly? Because he sadly, the Rebbe doesn't say sadly, but we know this is sad, he he thinks that he has no shaykhs with those Jews. It's one thing this Jew might say in his head. It's one thing the Jew who does terem mitzvahs, okay, not in consummate fashion. They're not as like, they're not, they're not sitting in koila like me. They're not doing every single mitzvah, but but, but they're, they're, they're doing terem mitzvahs. Okay, one thing you tell me, I have a shaykhs in them. And I can even see the shaykhs between me and the simpleton, who's just a, uh, a, a he just um, splits wood, he's a water carrier. And this is a Jew who considers himself to be Rashechem Shiftechem. He's so holy. He's so consummate. He's like, you know, up there. 
in terms of B'nai Yisrael. Okay, it's 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 a it's a Yerida. He has to come down in Madrega, love b'maga to even interface with these simple Jews. But he'll do it. Because after all is said and done, he still feels a responsibility and he still feels a kinship because you're talking about a Jew that is within the Anan, within the parameters of the cloud. But what kind of connection does he have to the Jew that's outside of the Anan, outside of the cloud of Tarim Mitzvah Rahman al -Islan? The Jew who just walked out of McDonald's, really? You want me to offer him that he should put on tefillin? He does not want to interface. He wants no business whatsoever with that kind of Jew. The most he can offer is that he will learn more Torah and daven more as a schus for this Jew. But you want me to leave the shul? You want me to leave the base medrash? You want me to leave my holy overtures and to run into the street and to find a Jew that is outside of the cloud? You want me to go places where there's no Yerushalayim? You want me to go out to the streets of Manhattan or wherever? No. L'chaira, seemingly, there's, there's, there's no way, Jose, that I'm going to do this. And how much more so if he falls into the category of people who learning Torah, that is their business. That's all they do. To the extent that it's possible be because it says about the Rashbi, so the Rebbe says to the extent that it's possible that somebody should, should make this their not just their avocation, but their vocation. This is what they do for a living. They learn Torah. So he has even more reason to say, nope, not doing anything for the Jew outside of the cloud. It's not my hood. It's not my beat. I do not go there. How do you want me to be mafsik in my high level of Torah I study Torah for a living. You want me to be mafsik and to run after a Jew? No. You want me to run after them in order to, to protect them, to strengthen them in their emuna. You want me to put more distance between them and additional chataim, and you want me to influence them to do another mitzvah. No, no, I don't, I refuse. It's not for me. And on this comes the hira from the first milchama the Bnei Yisrael waged when they left Mitzrayim, the milchama against Amalek. And this is the Hira. Vishash Amalek ba omizgare bi Yehudi hanimsa michutz la'anan. When Amalek comes and taunts a Jew, yes, a Jew that is found outside of the Anan. Afilu im himatsay sham hubash masay. Even if he's outside of the cloud, and it's his fault, which for most Jews, the Rebbe taught us, it's totally not their fault. And that's where they are, not because they chose that. But let's even say that it's a year that it's his fault. Because he, he was in a position where maybe he knew better. It is incumbent upon the Jews that are found within the cloud to leave and to protect the Jews in their fight against Abalik. 
On the contrary, mihem elu shalem mutelas beikar chayvus ayetzia amenas lahagin abanei shalom bnei amole. Who who do you think upon whom falls the main responsibility to protect these Jews from Amalek? Yerechet, those who have Yer Shemayim, those who are doing Torah mitzvahs. Shebiyadam davka hakayach lil chayim es mochemes Amalek, because only they actually have the kayach to wage war against Amalek. The aimed b'reish hamachama who Yeshua. Shaloi nemar hativik b'char lanu anoshim v'tzeim min. Ha'anan in parentheses, the is like, like saying, like that Moshe said to him, You, Yeshua, leave the Anan. And what do we know about Yeshua? Bari Yeshua, lo yamish Yeshua, we're taught about him that he never moved from the Ayel of Moshe. He was He was constantly learning with Moshe. And he, Dafka, the person, he was charged with the mandate to lead the war. And the Torah adds even more. Really, Moshe B'Pnimius essentially was the one who led the whole war. Who Shaminas Yeshua, Lishluchai, Lahanikas Amochama, he was the one that appointed Yeshua as his shliach. And the Chabad already told us, So it was almost like Moshe literally went out to war. And certainly spiritually, he was waging the war. He held his hands up in prayer all the time, a whole day till the sun went down, and we know that he made the sun um, last longer and longer. And he was fasting. And through all of this, he effectuated that B'nai Yisrael should win, that they should be strengthened. And so, in spite of all this, and in addition, and still, everything that he did is somehow seen as not enough. <coughs> he should have gone out by himself. And from this comes instruction to even the greatest one. It's not enough to just be invested and involved in the Muhammad against Amalek in every generation spiritually. It's not enough to say an extra parak to him that all the Yidin that are not doing Torah mitzvahs, that Hashem should arouse them to Tshuva. Not enough. Even though absolutely necessary, the Rebbe says, and it's one of the very, very, very important, exalted things to do. And it's not even enough that you should send a shliach. <laughs> but he himself has to go out and do what must be done to protect B'nai Yisrael. And through comporting ourselves in this way, not to engage in cheshbonis of tam v'das, even though all the cheshbonis are cheshbonis of kedusha, <coughs> but in the end of mechay mochay timcha zecha malik, it has to be done without cheshbonis. Noihe kach gama kadosh baruch hu. So then we will arouse reciprocity on the part of Hashem, the Indian, Machai Em Chazecher Molek, Lamaila Mechesbainis, and Medidas Bahagbalis. Hashem will once and for all eradicate a Molek in a way that transcends all parameters and all delineation, or Medale Galakates, or maybe Hagula Hasida, and Hashem kind of fast tracks. The Kate, the end of time, Mashiach's coming and brings the Geula. Sha'az Yeh Hashem Shalim, Bahakise Shalim. Hashem is going to be complete, meaning Bayamahu Yashem Echad, Shmayachad, 
and Hashem's power will be complete. And 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 this this is also um, from Rashi here. Bekar of Mamish or Bagola Didan, it should be speedily. It should be in our days now, like immediately, immediately, um, before we open up for our um, traditional bringing or exchange of feelings and words. I just want to once again remind everybody that Project Lakuti Sichas is now running their annual campaign and you can access it easily. And we ladies do have our own page. It's the Monday morning um, share. And um, if you could let other people know and reach out um, beyond the Anun and give people um, the opportunity to take part it would all help to promulgate the Torah of the Rebbe. And these are, it seems to me, the treasures that are being taken out in this last stand and this last phase of Geula. And they're being thrown to the wind and they're being given to everybody. And Project Kotesichas is doing that in a singular way. So any help we can give them is definitely a big source.